Today, inshallah, we will start in the Strabismus uh, chapter from Kansky, ninth edition. And inshallah, we will start with the introduction. It's a very interesting chapter. Uh, Kansky, it's very short for this chapter. If you need more detail, you should go for American Academy book. Okay, Dr. Saina, can you please start reading the introduction? Definitions. The visual axis passes from the fovea through the nodal point of the eye to the point of fixation. In normal binocular single vision, the visual axis of the two eyes intersect at the point of fixation. The image being aligned by the fusion reflex and combined by binocular responsive cells in the visual cortex to give BSV. Okay, this or is... Uh -huh. Yeah, this is very important definition, the visual axis. We should know there is there is two axes for the, the eye. The first one, we call it the anatomical axis, or we call it the pupillary axis, okay? Mm -hmm. So the anatomical axis starts from the center. This is the, the nodal point of the cornea, the central nodal point. This is the nodal point of the lens, the anterior capsule of the lens, and this is the nodal point of the posterior of the lens and it go directly toward mostly the optic nerve. This is the anatomical axis or the pupillary axis. The second one is the visual axis. The visual axis always you should remember the fovea. Where from where we see the best accurate visual acuity always it present and the fovea. So it will give us the visual axis. This is just how to remember it. So anatomical axis end at the optic nerve, the visual axis end at the fovea. So here, this is the nodal point. And at this nodal point, and here, this is the another nodal point in the center of the lens, they are intersect together. And here, at this part, there is an angle. So this is the visual axis, and this is the anatomical axis. And the angle between both of them, we call it the angle cava. This is very important. So here, here they said about how we see why there is Binocular single vision. Binocular single vision, that means you will see by both eyes. What what's that mean? That means when the visual axis, axis it goes through the fovea, then from the fovea, it will go to the responsive cells, the binocular responsive cells. These responsive cells present in the visual, the visual cortex in the brain. So it will take it by the optic nerve. The optic tract, optic, uh, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, optic radiation until it reaches the visual cortex. There you will there is the responsive cells present in the visual cortex that interpretation of the image, and that will lead to binocular single vision that the patient he make the fusion in from his both eyes that will make alignment uh, of the both eyes. Now we will go for the other definition. Yes. Orthophoria implies perfect ocular alignment in the absence of any stimulus for fusion. This, this is uncommon. Yes. Gitterophoria uh, implies a tendency of the eyes to deviate when fusion is blocked. Latin squint. Slight phoria is present in most normal individuals and is overcome by the fusion reflex. The phoria can be either a small inward imbalance as a phoria or an outward imbalance as a phoria. When fusion is insufficient to control the imbalance, the phoria is described as decompensating and is often associated with symptoms of binocular discomfort, astenopy, or double vision. Yes, so we have the orthophoria, heterophoria, and heterotropia. Phoria mean always latent. So the, the meaning of phoria, that mean latent. And how we, we diagnose the phoria and the tropia? By cover and uncover test. So when you make the cover test, okay, this is mostly it will detect the phoria. Okay, this is number one. The uncover test, it will lead you to detect the tropia. Okay, when you make the uncover, you will see the tropia. By the cover, you will see the latent uh, phoria. Okay, this is an alternate cover and uncover test. What it will be detected? Alternate, it will detect the phoria and the tropia, both of them. Okay, this is very important. 
So orthophoria that the patient he is straight and he has uh, straight eyes without anatropy and in the, the ortho position. Ortho means straight position in the primary position. But here they said here in the absence of any stimulus for fusion and this is uncommon. So mostly the the, the the all of the human being they are not orthophoria. They are there is because five degree of the angle cap, but there is difference. So you will see the reflex not exactly in the center. And now we will talk about it. So we have heterophoria. I think this is very clear, the latent swing. We have uh, isophoria and exophoria when the eye it go inward and exophoria when the eye it go a little bit outward. Uh, when the fusion is insufficient, the fusion insufficient, this is very important. The two image, it's not a fusion in the brain together. There is many causes for the insufficient of the fusion. One of them, the decompensating mechanism. The eye, it's not in the primal position. It's not straight. Uh, that is especially due to squint or many diseases. We will talk about it later. And this will end sometimes with asthenopia. Asthenopia means discomfort, or we call it uh, tired, tired of the eyes, especially after stress, after a lot of work, we call it asthenopia or the double vision diplopia. We will go for all of these details, inshallah. Continue. Heterotropia. Heterotropia implies a manifest deviation in which the visual axis don't intersect at the point of fixation. The image from the two eyes are misaligned so that as a double vision is present or more commonly in children, the image from the deviating eye is suppressed at cortical level. A child whose queen may occur because of failure of the normal development of binocular fusion mechanism or as a result of ocular motor imbalance secondary to a difference in refraction between the two eyes. Anisometropia. Failure of fusion, for example, secondary to pure vision in one eye, may cause heterotropia in adulthood, or a screen may develop because of weakness of mechanical restriction of the extraocular muscles or damage to the inner supply. Horizontal deviation of the eyes, latent or manifest, is the most common form of strabismus. Upward displacement of one eye relative to the other is termed a hypertropia and the latent upward imbalance a hyperphoria. Downward displacement is termed a hypertropia and a latent imbalance a hypophoria. Okay, so heterotropia that means manifest, not latent, manifest deviation. Manifest, you can see it when the patient comes with to the URI clinic from the first look, you look, the eye, it's go like isotropia, okay? Sorry for this, like deviation inward or exotropia deviation outward. So you you will see it manifest deviation. So here, what, what is the problem? The visual axis don't intersect at the point of fixation. So when there is no intersection of the fixation point due to this misalignment, this will lead to the tropia or the squinting because the eye, it tried to go to where the intersection of the point fixation to make the fusion. So this is why the squint, it's okay. Like a compensating mechanism, the eye tried to make it. So the image from the two eyes are misaligned. So one, one eye, it go like this, the other eye, it go like this. So here there is misalignment, we call it. So that either double vision, maybe it occur at this stage, especially uh, more common in children. So the image from the deviating eye is suppressed at the cortical level, and this will lead to the amplyopia. So when the brain, the brain, reach two image, always he take the much better image, like from the right eye here, it's the, the, the image, it reach six over six and very clear. The brain, it will take this image, and this image, if it's a blurry due to the deviating eye, it will make cancer for it. It will make suppression in the brain. And this suppression in the brain for this image, that will lead to amblyopia, okay? Mm -hmm. And the most common cause of amblyopia is the squint. So strabismus is the most common cause of amblyopia. We will talk about amblyopia in detail. So this is the suppression at cortical level. Okay, 
A childhood squint may occur because of failure of the normal development of binocular fusion mechanism or as a result of oculomotor imbalance secondary to a different uh, causes. So maybe why there is squinting in the children, maybe there is there is failure of the normal development, something in the, the, the development of the child from the, the infancy, okay, that will lead to uh, abnormality in the fusion mechanism. Second one, oculomotor, the oculomotor nerve, there is imbalance in it due to any cause of the oculomotor uh, palsy. Uh, also, they said here, secondary difference in refraction between the two eye anisometropia sometimes also, it lead to squinting. And anisometropia, when we said anisometropia, uh, for myopia mostly, the difference between eye, it should be high than the hypermetropia and the astigmatism. Like in myopia, it should be the difference more than minus four, some book they write it minus five. The hypermetropia, the difference between the two eye, more than plus three, and the astigmatism more than minus two. Uh, now we will go. We will go later on for the anisometropia in detail. Failure of effusion, the other cause of heterotropia, secondary to poor vision in one eye. So when there is poor vision in one of these eye, it will lead to failure of effusion. It will lead to heterotropia in the adulthood, or squinting may develop because of the weakness of these mechanical restriction. Uh, the last thing here, they mentioned the horizontal deviation. We have two types, the latent, so we call it heterophoria and the manifest heterotropia. Okay. Uh, the horizontal deviation is the most common from all type of strabismus, and most of the cases you will see in the surgical room are the horizontal squint, and very rarely or less common the vertical squinting. If there is upward displacement of the eye up, we call it hypertropia, down, uh, downward uh, hypotropia. And if it's latent upward, we call it hyperphoria. And if it's latent downward, we call it hypophoria. I think this is clear. Yes, let us read the anatomical axis and angle kappa. Is a lot. Anatomical axis is a line passing from the posterior pole through the center of the cornea because the fovea is usually slightly temporal to the anatomical center of the posterior pole of the eye. The visual axis doesn't usually correspond to the anatomical axis of the eye. Angle cap is an angle usually above 5 degrees subtended by the visual and anatomical axis. The angle is positive when the fovea is temporal to the center of the posterior pole, resulting in a nasal displacement of the corneal reflex and negative when the converse applies. A large angle cup may give the appearance of a squint when none is present, except the squint, and is seen most commonly as a pseudoexotropia following displacement of the macula in retinopathy of prematurity, where the angle may significantly exceed plus five. Okay, this is very nice. So the anatomical axis, we explain it, the line passing from the posterior bulb to the center of the cornea. Mm -hmm. So here we said it will go through the center of the Cornea at center of the lens, center of the posterior of the lens until it reaches the optic nerve. This is the anatomical axis, and always the visual axis it will reach to the fovea. So the fovea it's temporal to the uh, anatomical axis or the pupillary axis. Okay, so because of the fovea is usually slightly temporal, and when we look at the corneal reflex of the eye, you will see the corneal reflex not in the center. You will see it in fero nasally a little bit. In fero nasally, okay, mm -hmm. at this time, because the fovea it's temporally to the uh, anatomical axis, so the reflex not exactly in the center. So here, because of the fovea is temporal to the anatomical center of the posterior wall of the eye, the visual axis that go to the fovea doesn't usually correspond to the anatomical axis of the eye and this will lead to the angle kappa. I hope it's clear. Now maybe I will show some picture about it. So the angle kappa is the difference between the anatomical and the visual axis and it's five degree. Okay. So the angle is positive. Positive that means when the fovea is temporal, this is the normal. 
to the center of the, of the posterior wall, resulting in a nasal displacement of the corneal reflex. And negative when converse applies. So if it's the opposite, if you see the corneal reflex at the temporal side, that means there is a negative angle color. But when you see the corneal reflex at the nasal, uh, nasal this is positive angle kappa, and we accept the positive of angle kappa until plus five, okay? If more than that, there is problem or there is abnormality. So large angle kappa, this is give the appearance of a squint. What is the causes of large angle kappa, the pseudo squint? Especially here they mention one cause, the, the, the pseudo exotropia following the displacement of the macula and retinopathy of the prematurity. In ROB, the retinopathy of a prematurity, what's happened? Sometimes this is like near the right eye, the oblique disc, and near the phobia. So there is a traction. This attraction, it will sometimes in the, the later stage, the, the, the traction in brain or the false, it will pulse or pulse the phobia temporally removal, and this will increase the angle kappa, and we call it, and you will see the pseudo exotropia. Before we go to the anatomy of extracellular muscle, I make here some, some points. Uh, there are two significant optical axes of the eye, the optical, or we call it pupillary axis and visual axis. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not read this. I think this is clear. Just we will look at the picture. So here the optical axis or the pupillary axis and the visual axis, or we call it the anatomical axis. So the phobia, it's temporal to the anatomical axis. The optical or pupillary or anatomical axis, they are the same, from the center, cornea, center of the lens, center until it reaches the optic nerve here. Let us continue. Orthophoria, I think it's the same. Astino, astinopia, astinopia. Okay. So what is astinopia? Read it, please, Sanya. Definition a straight subjective symptoms of ocular fatigue, discomfort, lacrimation, and headaches arising from the use of eyes, weakness or tiring of eyes accompanied by pain, headache, blurry vision, sensitivity to light, or inability to keep the eyes open. So when there is eye strain, this eye strain it will end with subjective symptoms like lacrimation, fatigue, headache. This is what we call it astinopia because of weakness or tiring of the eye accompanied by pain due to tiring of the eye. Uh, isotropia, please. Uh, I will read it and I will explain it. It's the most common type of pseudostrabismus. Okay, so we have pseudostrabismus, pseudoisotropia, and pseudoexotropia. What is the causes of pseudoisotropia? This is very important. Due to facial morphological features, number one, shape and size of the orbit, size and shape of the globe, volume and viscosity of retrovalvar tissue, all of which can create an illusion of misaligned eye. The most common two causes for pseudoisotropia, number one, do you know this? Wide nasal bridge, okay? And number two, the ebicanthal folds. Ebicanthal folds and wide nasal bridge. Okay, and the epicanthal fold. These are the most common two causes for the pseudoisotropia. So here they mention them, the white nasal bridge with the prominent epicanthal folds. They are the most common two causes of, of pseudoisotropia. The epicanthal fold is semi-lunar fold of the skin at the medial canthus. Okay, patient with a small interbubular distance may also appear to be isotropic. So what is the causes? Number one, white nasal bridge. Number two, prominent epicanthal folds. Number three, small interbubular distance, the IBD. This is number three. All of these, it will give you pseudoisotropia. Now we will see the picture. Negative angle kappa formed by the pupillary axis and the visual axis at the pupil where the corneal light reflex appear to be on the temporal side. Where is the normal? The normal at the nasal side. We, we said it. Why at the nasal? Because the fovea is present at the temporal of the optic discs. Mm -hmm. That will give you nasal corneal reflex and positive angle kappa, mostly five degree. Okay, but when it's present at the temporal side, the corneal reflex, the opposite, not at the nasal side, we call it negative angle kappa. 
okay and negative angle kappa you will see it in pseudo isotropia okay of the very center can simulate an iso deviation or pseudo isotropia due to wide nasal bridge prominent epicatal fold or interpupillary distance okay this is the pseudo isotropia look look at the nasal bridge between the two medial canthi here okay and you can see here there is negative angle kappa okay but very clear the reflex here mostly at the center but here because of the ab capital fold and here you can see the ab capital fold also here so we have both of them wide nasal bridge ab capital fold this is pseudo isotropia it's not the true isotropia it's a pseudo there is something that will lead to the pseudo isotropia this is the second picture. This is very clear. You can see the epicatal fold, and you can see the wide nasal bridge here. Okay, this is another pseudo. He has normal corneal reflex here. Mostly here, the corneal reflex, when we said pseudoisotropia, that means negative angle kappa, and negative angle kappa, that means you will see it a yeah, little bit. Yeah, tem temporally, not exactly at the center. Actually, you can't, uh, from the picture, exactly see where is the corneal reflex you should use the ophthalmoscope and look from the whole of the ophthalmoscope not just make the light here and here look from the whole of the ophthalmoscope to the corneal reflex you can exactly know where is the corneal reflex i hope it's here yes, so now, uh, what is the pseudoisotropia? So here, as we mentioned before, pseudoisotropia, there is negative angle kappa. Here, pseudoisotropia, that means there is positive angle kappa, mostly more than five degree, okay? So here, mm -hmm. like pseudoisotropia, there is morphological also feature of the face can result in a false appearance of the eye to be drifted outward, most commonly the hyperpolarism. Actually, this is very common and question the causes of pseudoisotropia and pseudoisotropia. Uh, and what is the hyperpolarism? Hyperpolarism is an abnormally, abnormally increased lateral distance between the orbits. Like just, or I will just sit in at this picture here. Like so in Wadenburg syndrome. In which syndrome? Wadenburg. Yes, Wadenburg. Yes, Wardenberg, you are right. So this is the, the lateral the lateral orbital part, and this is the lateral orbital part. So the distance between this and this, when it's increased, they call it hyperpolarism. Okay, telecanthus, what is telecanthus? If they said that the medial canthi, the distance between the medial canthi, the inner medial canthi here and here, it increased. This is what we call it telecanthus. But when the lateral orbital distance, it will increase, we call it hyperpolarism. Okay, I hope it's much clear. So here, uh, which is widely set eyes, can result in pseudoexotropia, traction of the retina, resulting in pathological ectopia of the macula, temporarily can cause positive angle kappa, resulting in nasal displacement of the light reflex on the cornea, stimulating pseudoexotropia. So here, any disease that will lead to traction of the macula at the temporal side, make positive angle kappa like ROB, uh, like which other disease, retropathy of fibromaturity. Uh, there is another one in the uveitis. Now it's not coming in my mind. Okay. Uh, that will lead to a temporally uh, fractional of the macula. Uh, that will lead to positive angle kappa. Then, Pseudoexotropia from positive angle kappa is mostly seen in retinopathy of prematurity, which results in temporary dragging of the macula. Also in toxocariasis, yes, this one. Toxocariasis, due to it will lead to retinal scar. The toxocariasis, always the toxocariasis, what you will see, you will see peripheral granuloma. Peripheral granuloma. And this peripheral granuloma, there is a membrane coming from this peripheral granuloma toward the fovea or the macula, and it make a tractional temporally for the macula. This is the toxocariasis. Okay, highly myopia or congenital retinal folds. 
Also, the same thing about the congenital retinal folds. It will make a traction for the macula temporally. High myopia, it will lead to pseudoexotropia. This is one of the most important questions come in the MCQ before in the ICO exam. So high myopia also, it will lead to pseudoexotropia. If this is a case, you can see how like it appear and uh, the fovea, uh, the cornea reflex appear more nasally and the eye drifted a little bit like outward. This is pseudoexotropia. Maybe here there is hypertolerism or maybe there is pathological disease. Okay. Okay. Now let us come back to the action or the anatomy of the extraocular muscles. Yes, can you read from here? The lateral and medial orbital walls are at an angle of 45 with each other. The orbital axis therefore forms an angle of 22.5 with both lateral and medial walls. Uh, so for the sake of simplicity, this angle is usually regarded as being 23. When the eye is looking straight ahead at a fixed point on the horizon with the head erect, primary position of gaze, the visual axis forms an angle of 23 with the orbital axis. The actions of the extraocular muscles depend on the position, uh, position of the globe at the time of muscle contraction. The anatomy of muscles is illustrated. The primary action of a muscle is its major effects when the eye is in the primary position. Subsidiary actions are the additional effects which depend on the position of the eye. The listening plane, plane is an imaginary coronal plane passing through the center of rotation of the globe. The globe rotates on the axis of fig which intersect in the stem plane. Okay, before the you continue, mm -hmm. I will just explain this main point. Actually, this is the, the anatomy and how it's work. It's very important because you will understand the movement of each muscle. What is the primary action? What is the secondary action? And what is the tertiary action for each muscle? This will help you, especially in the assessment later on. Okay, this is very important. Mm -hmm. So now we will look at the picture and it's very easy. There is lateral and medial orbit. The angle between both of them is 45. Just imagine here like the eye. Now we will see the picture, the lateral and medial. The angle between both of them 45. So the orbital axis forms an angle of 22.5 with the both lateral and medial one. So the, the axis that come from like the orbit or intersects is a 23. And this mm -hmm. the 23 angle, it will help us a lot later on. Now we will read about it. So just main point to remember it here. So when the eye is looking straight ahead at a fixed point on the horizon with the head erect in the primary position, what is the visual axis form? It's at the angle of a 23 with the orbital axis. So the visual axis forms a 23 angle with the orbital axis in the primary position of gaze. So in the primary position of gaze, how much the angle? It's a 23 with the orbital, the visual axis and the orbit with the orbital axis. Now we will understand what that means later on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the primary position, what does that mean? Of the muscle, it's it, it, of a muscle is its major effect when the eye in the primary position. Primary position means the muscle, its effect here, it's the major effect of the muscle. Subsidiary action, this is the secondary and tertiary effect of the, the eye, depend on the position of the eye. When she it look at the right, left, up, down, this is subsidiary action of the muscle. Listening plane, now we will look at the picture of listening plane. This is the listening plane here. First of all, let us see, this is here in the primary position, okay, between, this is the visual axis, what we said, the visual axis, we said the visual axis, the line that starts from the center and here until it reaches the fovea, visual axis, the, the, the area of seeing, the fovea, visual axis, and the mm -hmm. orbital axis between the medial and lateral world, it's 45, okay, 
angle mm -hmm. and the, the, the angle that between the lateral and medial orbital wall from the center that it will intersect the visual axis this line this is the orbital axis and the angle between the orbital and visual axis is a 23 so here this is the visual axis here the 23 here this one this is the visual axis and this one here this is the orbital axis okay and the angle it's 23 degree okay and here 45 between the lateral and medial wall of the, of the orbit this, it will help us a lot during when we're reading about the action of the muscle so here uh, now, now we will see so when it the eye it go 23 degree abducted and when the eye it go 51 abduction these two numbers you should remember them 23 and 51 now we will talk about it in the next paragraph this is the listing plan this is like uh, imaginary plan and the axis of fix the eye it move like this this is like the plan okay and what inside this plan like uh, a pole this is the pole and this is here the axis of a flick this is the axis of flick from the center of the eye okay here this is the axis of flick this 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 area and there is one plan like this okay vertically plan horizontally plan and like there is an oblique plan so the eye it move at this center of the plan right left up down then rotated inter internally rotated externally and this will help us to understand how the eye it move according to imaging the, the axis of fic okay mm -hmm. and the listing of a plan now we will see how that will help us so the listing plan is an imaginary coronal plane passing it with the center of rotation of the globe the globe rotate on the axis of fic so how the globe rotate at this axis that we the axis of thick, the vertical, horizontal, and the uh, torsional axis. Yes, read read the axis here. The globe rotate. Uh, rotates left and right on the vertical z axis. Yes, this is the vertical z axis here. Okay, so at this mm -hmm. axis, the globe it rotate right and left at this axis, the vertical one okay z axis just this is an imaginary axis we should imagine it to understand the movement yes then the globe moves up and down on the horizontal x axis yes this is the horizontal axis from here to here mm -hmm. and it moves like this up and like this down okay then the last one the y or the rotational axis uh Transitional moments where will rotations occur on the y sagittal axis, which tra uh, traverses the globe from front to back, similar to the anatomical axis of the eye. Yes, in torsion occurs. In torsion occurs when the superior limbus rotates nasally and extorsion on temporal rotation. Yes, this is here the y axis. Okay. This one here. So when the the, the the limbus rotate nasally, this is in torsion. When the the limbus rotate uh, temporally, this is extorsion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just you can you can imagine it at the y axis here. How the extorsion occur? How the extortion occur? Okay. Look at the limbus and look where it's rotate nasally or temporally. Okay, horizontal reply, continue. When the eye is in the primary position, the horizontal recti are purely horizontal movers on the vertical z axis and have only primary actions. Yes. Media rectus. Uh, originate at the analysis of thin at the orbital apex and inserts. 5.5 millimeter behind the nasal limbus. Its sole action in the primary position is adduction. And lateral rectus originates as the analysis of thin and inserts 6.9 millimeter behind the temporal limbus. Its sole action in the primary position is abduction. 
Okay, let me explain the horizontal and vertical rectifier today. Okay, first of all, let us go to the, this is, we call it a spiral of telux. Now we will talk about it, but the medial of medial rectus, insertion side of the medial rectus, 5.5 ah. from the limbus, the inferior 6.5, the lateral 6.9, and the severe rectus 7.7. .7. This is very important, these numbers, you should remember it exactly. And all of these, the origin of it, they are origin from the annulus of Z. So in the primary position, the horizontal recti, it will move on the vertical Z axis and have only primary action. So the horizontal recti, they have just a primary action, adduction of the medial recti, adduction, or abduction of the lateral recti. So this is uh, the only action of the both muscles, okay? and have only primary action. So then again, here you can see this is the picture of the muscles, the origin and the insertion. So here the superior rectus started from the annulus of Zen and it will enter 7.7 .7 from the limbus, okay, far from the limbus. And this is here the lateral rectus, 6.9 from the limbus. Here the insertion of it and origin from annulus of Zen, medial rectus here 5.5, and this is here the trochlea, and this is the superior oblique. The superior oblique, very beautiful muscles. Now we will talk about it, how it goes later on. Okay, and here there is another picture from another review, later review. Okay, so let us go. So here medial rectus, origin from the annulus of Zen, and insert 5.5 from the nasal limbus. And the, its sole lonely action is the in the primary position is adduction. And for the lateral rectus, 6.9 from the temporal limbus, and its only action is abduction in the primary position. Okay, now the vertical recti, the superior and inferior recti, yes. So vertical recti run in line with the orbital axis and are inserted in front of the equator. They therefore form an angle of 23 with the visual axis. Superior rectus originates from the upper part of the annulus of thin and inserts 7.7 mm behind the superior limbus. The primary action is elevation. Secondary actions are abduction and intorsion. When the globe is abducted 23 degrees, the visual and orbital axis coincide. In this position, it has no subsidiary actions and can act only as an elevator. This is therefore the optimal position of the globe for testing the function of the superorectus muscle. If the globe were adducted 67, the angle between the visual and orbital axis would be 90. In this position, the superior rectus could only act to intort the eye. Yes, this is this is very important, and I will explain it in the picture here. So first of all, originate the vertical recti run in line with orbital axis. So we will go to the again for the picture of orbital axis and you remember here the medial and lateral wall and it, there is intersect line we call it a 23 angle between the uh, visual axis and uh, the orbital axis so here the, the vertical recti it form an angle of a 23 with the visual axis okay like like the same with the, between the orbital and visual axis so here it originated from the upper part of the annulus of Zen and it's 7.5 behind the superior limbus. I think we see it in the picture, mm -hmm. it's clear. So the primary action, it's elevation. When you will see this elevation, when the eye, especially it's abducted at 23. Look, look at this picture here. Okay, here the eye, look at the eye from the primary position, it's abducted at 23. So here, when it abducted at 23, you cancel, you cancel like the, the secondary and the tertiary movement of the severe rectus. 
you just keep the primary action of the eye. Okay, so at 23, the superior rectus, it will be just elevator. Elevator. Because you put the eye at the axis where the superior rectus, it's intersect with the orbital or with the, sorry, with the visual axis. Again, look here. This axis, why it's help, helpful here. It form an angle 23 with the visual axis. So when the eye is abducted 23, you will cancel. You will cancel the you will cancel the secondary and tertiary axis and the muscle it work mm -hmm. at just elevator. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you make it adduction, adduction, 67, 67 plus 23, how much? Plus 23. 60, sorry, let me write it good. 67 plus 23. Adduction. Just move the eye adduction. 67 plus 23, it will be 90 degree. At 90 degree, the muscle, it will work as just in torture. In torture. In torsion. Okay? So when the, uh, when the axis, 67 from the visual axis, it will form a 90 degree. Okay? Uh, uh, and this will end uh, 90 degree from the visual axis, and this will lead to in torsion of the eye. This is how the severe rectus, it will work. Okay, so just now I will read it for you just again. When the globe is abducted, abduction 23, the visual and orbital axis coincide. Coincide, that means they are become at the same axis. Mm -hmm. What that will lead here, there is, in this position, it has no subsidiary action. There is no secondary, no tertiary action of the muscle. Because you make the two axes at the same point. I hope it's clear for you. So mm -hmm. the muscle, it will act just as elevator. It will just elevate the eye. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So here, the, this is therefore the optimal position of the globe for testing. So when you want to examine the superior rectus elevation, what is the best position? Tell the patient to abduct it a little bit. Abduction, mm -hmm. 23 degree. Then tell him abduction a little bit, then tell him to look up. You can see here the action of the superior uh -huh. rectus. At this position, this is the best position you can see the action of superior rectus, okay? Yeah. If the globe abducted 67, so here the angle between the visual and orbital axis, it will reach 90 degree. I, mm -hmm. I think it's clear now. You, you remember mm -hmm. here, this is yeah. the orbital, this is the visual axis. But if you make it at adduction 67, so here between the visual and orbital, it will reach 90 degree. So here the superior rectus can just make the intorsion action of the eye. Okay. Now the inferior rectus, it's the same thing, but we, we see depression and extortion. The superior rectus, always the, mm -hmm. just a note for you, always the superior muscle, they are intortors. In, what is the intortors of the eye? They are the superior rectus and the superior oblique. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, the, the extorter, they are the inferior. What is the extorter? The inferior rectus, it's an extorter, and the inferior oblique. Okay? So the inferior, inferior extorter. Mm -hmm. The superior, they are intorter. So superior rectus, superior oblique, intorter. Inferior rectus, inferior oblique, extorter. Uh, this is how to remember it. Yes, read the inferior rectus. Inferior rectus originates at the lower part of the annulus of skin and inserts 6.5 millimeter behind the inferior limbus. The primary action is depression. Secondary actions are adduction and extortion. Yes, when the globe is abducted 23. The inferior rectus acts purely as a depressor. As for superior rectus, this is the optimal position of the globe for testing the function of the inferior rectus muscle. If the globe were adductive uh, 67, the inferior rectus could act to extort the eye. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is very clear. Now also we will look at the muscle just again. So the primary action is depression. The secondary action are adduction and extortion. And uh, here, 
uh, always the superior muscles they are extorter, the inferior muscle they are uh, uh, sorry, the superior muscle they are intorter, the inferior muscle they are extorter. So again, just when you make the abduction, 23 here you will cancel the, 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 the cancel the secondary and tertiary action and the muscle it will be just depressor. It will just depress the globe down. And here this is the best division to, to examine the action of the the primary action of the inferior victus. And when it's abducted 67, it will make extortion of the eye. I don't think if there is mm -hmm. any picture for it. Ah, this is for the oblique. So for the, the superior and inferior rectus, you should remember two numbers. This come in the ICO exam, 23 abduction and 67 abduction. Add. Okay. 23 abduction and 67 abduction. Okay. Read the spi spiral of Tilox. The spiral of Tilox is an imaginary line during the insertion of the four recti and is an important anatomical landmark when performing surgery. The insertions are located progressively further away from the limbus in a spiral pattern. The medical medial rectus insertion is closest, followed by the inferior rectus, lateral rectus, and superior rectus. So the spiral of Tilox is an imaginary line. Just you can imagine it. And when you want to examine exactly where the insertion, you just bring the caliber and you put at the limbus the caliber and you put 7.7, 5.5, 6.5, 6.9 to exactly know where is the insertion of the muscle. So it's just an imaginary line. Uh, yes, continue the oblique muscles. The obliques are inserted behind the equator and form an angle of 51 with the visual axis. Superior oblique originates superior medial to the optic foramen. It passes forward through the trochlea at the angle between the superior and medial walls and it is then reflected backwards and laterally to insert in the posterior upper temporal quadrant of the globe. The primary action is in torsion, secondary action are depression and abduction. The anterior fibers of the superior oblique tendon are primarily responsible for in torsion and the posterior fibers for depression, allowing separate surgical manipulation of these two actions. When the globe is adducted, 51, the visual axis coincides with the line of pull of the muscle. In this position, it can act yes. only as a depressor. This is therefore the best position of the globe for testing the action of the superior oblique muscle. Thus also, the superior oblique has an abducting action in primary position. The main effect of the superior oblique weakness is seen as fail of depression in abduction. When the eye is abducted, 39, the visual axis and the superior oblique make an angle of 90 with each other. In this position, the superior oblique can cause only intorsion. Okay, this is very nice. Now I will explain it to you and also I will go to picture to let you understand. So here it's inserted behind the equator and form an angle of 51 with the visual axis. So just again here, this is the visual ax axis and just at adduction here, just put 51, remember adduction. So here 51, so this is the insertion here, the insertion of the superior oblique muscle. So it will form the axis of the superior oblique with the visual axis is 51. This, this number is very important. And when it make it abduction 39, it will form 90 degree the superior oblique with the uh, visual superior oblique with the visual axis. When it abducted 39, it will form 39 uh, degree. Okay, just add 51 mm -hmm. plus the 39. So these two positions, it will help us when it become depression, when it become intorsion. First of all, you should understand the, the anatomy of the superior oblique. This is very imp important. Originate superior medial to the optic foramen. Okay, the optic foramen, superior medial to it. Then it passes forward through the trochlea at the angle between the superior and medial wall. And then reflected backward and laterally. 
let us go to the picture. So, uh, as we said just again, it reflected backward, okay, backward and laterally to insert in the posterior upper temporal quadrant. So here, this is the picture of a superior oblique. Here from, they said superior medially to the optic foramen. It originated from this side, then it will go like this. This is the superior oblique between the superior and the medial wall of the orbit. The superior wall above it, the medial wall above it, until it reached the trochlea, And it have the long tendon between all of the muscles. Okay, then it reflect backward, look backward, mm -hmm. backward, okay, and laterally, look, it go to the lateral side, backward to the lateral side, here, the insertion of the superior oblique muscle, so in the posterior, superior, temporal part of the globe, okay, just look mm -hmm. at it, yeah, it's a little bit complicated, but in the posterior, upper, temporal quadrant of the globe. This is the insertion of it, okay? This is why it have two action, okay? The primary action is in torsion. It will, mm -hmm. as I said, the superior muscle, they are in torsion. How to remember the, the secondary action? Just I will give you a trick to remember it because here I said adduction for the superior and the rectus now we said abduction. Always oblique, oblique muscles. It has the letter B, okay, and letter B, so it always the secondary action for it, it's abduction, superior and inferior oblique are abduction, okay, oblique, B, up, B, the superior and inferior rectus, they are adduction, okay, the secondary action for superior and inferior rectus, just adduction, D, D. but oblique, the secondary action, B, B, abduction, also the inferior oblique, abduction, Okay, this is just to remember the secondary action. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a small trick for the students. So the primary action is in torsion. The secondary action are depression and, as we said, abduction. Okay? Now, always remember when the muscles, the axis of the muscle, it con co coincide with the visual axis, always the action of the muscle, it will be elevator or depressors if it's superior or inferior rectus, or if it's superior oblique or inferior oblique. So when the coincide with the visual axis 51 here, the muscle, it will work as depressor. And the inferior rectus, when it coincide with the 23 reaction, it will work as depressors. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the depression, when it coincide with the, 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 the axis of the muscle, okay, this is... Very important. So the primary action is in torsion. Secondary action, as we said, depression and abduction. And I hope it's clear. Here, this, this part is very important. And it, it, it's very important because also it helps us to show us which procedure you should do here in the superior oblique. So we have the anterior fibers of the superior oblique tendon are primary for in torsion. Okay, as we said, the primary action is in torsion, but the in torsion occurs from where? from the, the anterior fibers. The superior oblique, it has anterior fibers. Also, it has the posterior fibers. The anterior fibers, it will make the intorsion. The posterior fibers, it will make the depression. So when we make the coincide at the 51 degree, the posterior fibers, it will, it will work and it will lead to depression, okay? So this is very important. And when we make surgery like Harada, ETO procedures and other surgery, sometimes they, you work at the anterior fibers, and if you want to work at the depression, you will work at the posterior fibers, okay? Allowing separate surgical manipulation of these two actions. So this is the anterior and posterior fiber for the superior oblique, the anterior fiber. What is its action? In torsion, okay? Yes. And the posterior fiber, what its action? It's depression okay mm -hmm. this is very important especially in the surgical now we will go to our uh, rule when the globe is adducted 51 okay when it's adduction 51 here is different we said in the superior inferior rectus abduction abduction 23 you will coincide coincide the visual axis with the, the axis of the muscles 
with the or with the axis of the muscle, then it will be cancelled, then the muscle become elevator or depressors here because if the muscles at this side just imagine the group like this. So here at at 51, it will be coincide with the visual axis, and here you can cancel the secondary and tertiary. Sorry, you will cancel the intortion here, the primary, it will work here, the posterior fiber, it will work. The posterior fibers of the muscle, it work, that will lead to the depression, okay? So here, as they said, the secondary action, the depression, it will start when it consigned with the visual action. So here, when the globe is adducted 51, the visual axis consigned with the line of pull of the muscle in this position, it can act as depression as just the precious muscles, okay, here. Mm -hmm. This is, mm -hmm. therefore, the best position of the globe for testing the action of superior oblique muscles. So when you, how you can examine the superior oblique muscle, tell the patient to like, to make adduction, okay? If you want to examine the right eye, tell him to look at the left side, okay? And when you, this is the left side, and when you want to tell him to examine the left eye superior oblique, tell him to look at the right side. Make him in adduction position. Then you can see the action of the superior oblique, the posterior fibers of it, the depression fiber. This is very important. Okay. Uh, also, the superior oblique has abduction action in the primary position. The main effect of superior oblique weakness is seen as failure of depression in adduction. So when there is superior oblique palsy, that means there is fourth nerve palsy, these patients, they will complain from what? Third nerve palsy. They will complain during going number one in reading mm -hmm. because the eye in adduction and depression, which muscle it will work? Adduction and depression, adduction 51 and depression the superior oblique. So mm -hmm. when they read, they have a problem. So in fourth nerve palsy, they have a problem in the reading. And when they go down the stairs, one down the stairs, you will use your superior oblique. So what is the two position for the superior oblique during reading, reading, and during down stairs? Is it clear? Uh, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the superior oblique, it's the pressure, the pressure at 51 adduction so when the adduction can examine the depression of the severe oblique so here the severe oblique has abduction action primary position the main effect of the severe oblique weakness is seen failure of the depression in adduction and when the eye is abducted 39 so here the visual axis and the superior oblique it will lead to 90 degree here you can see the uh, in this position the superior oblique, it will make the intortion. So here in this position, the anterior fiber of the superior oblique, it will work. So here you can see at this, at abduction, you can see the intortion of the globe. And at abduction, you can see the depression of the globe. I hope it's clear for you. Let us read the inferior oblique. Originates from a small depression just behind the orbital rim lateral to the lacrimal sac. It passes backward and laterally to insert in the posterior lower temporal quadrant of the globe close to the macula. The primary action is extortion, secondary actions are elevation and abduction. Yes. When the globe is adducted to 51, the inferior oblique acts as an elevator only. When the eye is abducted to 39, its main action is extortion. Yes, I think this is very clear. Just I will explain it very quickly. Here, this is the insertion of superior oblique tendon here in this picture. Okay. Here, this is the superior rectus muscle at this part, superior rectus as a good from the temporal aspect. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the inferior oblique, just again, it originated from a small depression behind the orbital rim lateral to the lacrimal sac. Okay, so it's behind the orbital rim lateral to the lacrimal sac. Just imagine where is the lacrimal sac and it goes to the punctum lateral to it. It passed backward okay and laterally to insert the posterior lower temporal quadrant of the globe close to the macula and this is the most muscle close to the macula 
and mm-hmm. here always you should be careful not go deep during surgery or things maybe you will you will hit the macula or you will go very deep so always you should be careful when you uh, make your surgery so it go insert posterior lower temporal quadrant of lower temporal just imagine it the lower temporal quadrant when we say about the superior oblique it go like this and it go to the t- superior posterior superior temporal quadrant here the lower temporal quadrant and it's close to the macula this is why it's extort extortion not intortion so the primary action is extortion secondary action are elevation and abduction abduction as we said oblique b b abductors okay and always as we mentioned the the inferior muscles they are extorted and the superior muscle they are intorted so the primary action extortion the secondary abduction and also elevation so here just again the same thing when it's just abduction at this side here it will work as elevator only the inferior oblique it will elevate by when it's abducted it will form 90 degree and it will become as extortion yes read the muscle pulleys then the innervation yes the four rectors muscles pastoral con- condensations of connective tissue and smooth muscle just posterior to the quad these condensations act as pulleys and minimize upward and downward movements of the bellies of the medial and lateral rectus muscles during up gaze and down gaze and horizontal movements of the superior and inferior rectus bellies in left and right case. Pulleys are the effective origins of the rectus muscles and play an important role in the coordination of eye movements by reducing the effect of horizontal movements on vertical muscle actions and vice versa. Displacement of the pulleys is a cause of abnormalities of eye movements such as V and A patterns. Okay, so what is the pulleys of the muscle? They are just connective tissue. Okay, they are the condensation of the connective tissue and a smooth smooth muscle just posterior to the equator. So the, the pulleys they are like the connective tissue that present around the muscle or just uh, covering the muscle posterior to the equator. This condensation act as a pulleys and minimize the upward and downward movement of the pillars of the medial and lateral rectus. Like the, it like steadiness the muscle. Okay, so the muscle, it has a, a pili and a pulleys. Pulleys, the connective tissue that surround the muscle that make it more stabilized, just in a simple word, uh, okay? Make it mm-hmm. more stabilized. Okay, so the, the medial and lateral rectus, it will work just for abduction and abduction due to this pulleys. Because if there is no pulleys, maybe the medial and lateral rectus, it will make upward or downward. It will move a little bit downward or upward, but it make it, stable in its position just in a simple way okay so this it will help in the horizontal movement of the muscle okay just again the condensation act as pulleys and minimize upward and down movement of the bellies of medial and lateral rectus during up gaze and down gaze and horizontal movement of the superior and inferior rectus in left and right gaze due to this pulleys it will help to stabilize the action of the muscle the bullets are effective origin of the rectus muscle Okay, uh, play an important role in the coordination of eye movement by reducing the effect of the horizontal movement on the vertical muscle action and vice versa. So when you want to move the medial and lateral rectus, these pulleys, it will help not to let make vertical action for the muscle upward and forward, and the opposite for the superior and inferior rectus. The displacement of these pulleys, it will lead to the V button and A button. We will speak about V and A button just in a simple way. When you have bilateral inferior oblique over action, the eye mostly it will go a little bit in abducted position like B button. When you have bilateral superior oblique over action, you will see the A button. The eye it will go a little bit like this. Okay, this is just in a simple word, but we will go for the detail about what is the causes for B and A button in the during this session. The innervation, I think it's very easy. The lateral rectus is by the abducent nerve, the superior oblique by the fourth cranial nerve, and the other muscles, it's by the third nerve. The third nerve, it, it is separated in superior division, superior division, and inferior division. 
and the superior mm -hmm. division it will give you the levator muscles okay mm -hmm. and also the levator muscle and the superior rectus muscles and the inferior division it will give you the inferior rectus the medial rectus and also the inferior oblique muscles this mm -hmm. is why the inferior division the superior division the levator palpebral superioris and the superior rectus muscle so the other muscle levator muscle of the upper lid and the ciliary and sphincter bubuli muscle are supplied by the oculomotor nerve let us just see if there is any note here okay uh, this is this is the table from american academy the primary secondary tertiary action actually this is very important media rectus adduction lateral rectus abduction they they divide the inferior superior rectus the primary action depression then the severe rectus elevation, the secondary action, they put it as extortion. As I told, the inferior, they are extorter, the inferior and inferior oblique, they are extorter. And the severe rectus and the severe oblique, they are intorter. And the third, the third action for the inferior rectus, it's adduction. And the severe rectus also, it's adduction. So adduction, adduction for inferior severe rectus. Inferior oblique, as we said, BB. So it's the third action, abduction, yeah. abduction. Mm -hmm. And the primary action, extortion here, here in torsion. And the secondary action, elevation for the inferior oblique, depression for the superior oblique. I think this is very clear. Levator papyrus virus is elevation of upper lip. You can take a screenshot for this table and save it. It will help you to understand the action of each muscle. Mm -hmm. I, do you have any question for the lecture today? No. It's a clear. Yes, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, why oblique muscles? Um, for example, why inferior oblique muscle works uh, to it, it elevate? It elevate, but uh, it seems like it, it uh, has to uh, depress. Why it, it's elevated? Okay, let me just show you how we can e examine the, the, the inferior oblique over action. Okay. Inferior oblique yeah. muscle insertion. Uh. Just to show you the picture, you will understand it very nice. This is the inferior oblique muscle. So it comes from here, okay, and it will go to the posterior lateral board toward the macula. So its action, it 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 work as extortion at this side, and also when it pull the globe from here, from this side to this side, also it will elevate the globe. Just imagine where is the insertion of the muscle, you can understand the action of it. The superior oblique, it coming from up like this. So it will lead to intorsion, okay, and depression. The inferior oblique like this, the superior oblique like this. This movement here, intorsion. Also depression with intorsion, but the extortion always there is elevation with it, okay? Just imagine this picture, you can understand it. When you see some movement of the muscle, you can understand it more. This is the uh -huh. inferior oblique. Is it clear? From just this picture, you can understand yeah. it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So the inferior oblique, they are elevation and extortion. The superior mm -hmm. oblique, they are intorsion and depression. Do you have any other question? No. no. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, all of the best for all of the people. They will watch this video, inshallah.